We're, we are recording. Thank you. Um, it is 4.35 p.m. and seeing a presence of a quorum of the Community Resources Committee, I am calling the September 8th, 2022 meeting to order. Um, pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the Acts of 22 and by chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. At this time, I'm going to take attendance to ensure that uh, the members can hear us and we can hear them. Shalini. Present. Uh, Mandy is present. Pam. Present. Jennifer. Present. And Pat DeAngelis is not here yet. Um, we will see if she arrives at a later time and, and check it. if she does, we will make sure she can hear us. Um, at this time, we're going to go into our scheduled agenda um, because we have continued public hearings to hold um, that were settled for 4.30 and 4.35. So um, in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40A, this public hearing of the Community Resources Committee of uh, this continued public hearing of the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the bylaw. Zoning bylaw Article 2, Zoning Districts, Article 3, Use Regulations, and Article 16, FEMA Floodplain Overlay District. To see if the town will vote to add Article 16, FEMA Floodplain Overlay District to the Zoning Bylaw, amend Article 2 Zoning Districts to add FEMA Floodplain Overlay District and amend related sections of Article 3 Use Regulations to regulate activities in the 100-year floodplain as shown in the flood insurance rate map issued by the Federal Emergency Management Agency for the administration of the National Insurance Flood Insurance Program. Firm maps indicate areas that have a 1% chance of flooding in a given year. The purpose of the floodplain management regulations is to protect the public health, safety, and general welfare to and to minimize the harmful impacts of flooding upon the community. We are opening this or opening the continued hearing at 4.38 p.m. Um, this has been continued from, um, when was it continued from? May 26, 2022. So at this time, there are two. This one is all of the zoning regulations. The next one after we do something with this one is the actual zoning map. Um, we will probably, I, Chris will probably discuss both <laughs> during, during her presentation here. I don't know how she's splitting it up, um, but we will technically have two hearings today. Um, the way the hearing is going to be held is just like everything else. We already did disclosures unless there's any changes with that. We'll move right on to the presentation from our planning director, and then we'll do questions from the committee, questions from the public, public comment, um, app, any responses, and any further questions from the committee. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Chris Brestrup. And Chris, you'll let me know when you want me to share a screen, right? Yes, thank you. Um, so again, I'm Chris Brestrup, planning director, um, and I'd like to remind CRC members of a few things about the flood mapping project and bring you up to date on where we are today with this project. So as uh, reviewing a little of the past uh, actions, on February 28th, 2022, uh, planning staff gave a brief presentation of this project to town council members. And on April 25th, 2022, the town council referred the zoning portion of this project um, to, uh, to the planning board and CRC for public hearings. On May 2nd, the town council referred the firm maps or, and flood insurance or flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance study to the CRC for a recommendation. Um, on March 16th, we gave a presentation to the planning board members and then we opened a public hearing on the project on May 26th with the CRC and on June 1st with the planning board. Um, at that time, we did not have um, the uh, letter of final determination um, from FEMA and we didn't have the final maps. 
Um, there are two different but associated items for the planning board and the CRC and town council to consider and adopt. And one is the zoning amendments, which includes the text and the map. And the other is the FEMA firm maps, flood insurance rate maps, and the flood insurance study. So we'll talk about those. Um, this introduction, uh, the town of Amherst is a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program, and that's administered by FEMA. Uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, this program provides flood insurance for property owners whose properties are subject to flooding if the municipality in which the property is located participates in the flood insurance program. Um, the town has been working on this project of updating the flood insurance rate maps um, and the flood insurance study for about 10 years since 2012, and we're hoping to wrap it up this year. Um, the purpose of the project is to create ac accurate federally approved maps for land affected by flooding in order to provide information to banks, landowners, the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board, and to other interested parties. So Amherst's flood maps were last updated in 1983, and new and better technology for mapping flood areas is now available and town meeting appropriated funds during several town meeting cycles to update the maps. The consulting firm AECOM was hired by the town and has been working with us um, to create these new maps and has mapped um, areas along rivers and streams in Amherst. In September uh, 2017, the preliminary flood insurance rate maps were presented to members of the planning board, the conservation commission and the public. And at that time, the town became aware of a new method of analyzing flood data and determining flood boundaries. And this new method had just come into use in the spring of 2017. Um, the town decided to appropriate additional money to update the maps further using this method that was called the 2017 regression analysis. And mapping uh, using this new method has now been completed. And there have been three appeal periods, um, only one of which resulted in an appeal, which was eventually resolved. Most of the maps have been on uh, online available for view since July of 2020. And there were three recently revised panels that have been available for re review since July of 2021. Um, the maps have been presented at public meetings, including town council, CRC, and planning board. One of these meetings was held on June 25th, 2019. And at that time we sent notifications to people who owned property in the floodplain as depicted on the new maps. Um, so the old 1983 maps were based on USGS topography. I forget what USGS stands for, but Dave probably remembers. Um, and that was at 10 foot intervals. You probably remember some of the old hiking maps that um, had 10 foot intervals on them. And they were also based on data gathered up to the early and mid 1970s. Um, the new maps are based on Town of Amherst GIS topography, which has one foot contour. So that's much more accurate. And they're also based on recently gathered data. So we've been gathering data since the mid 70s up until quite recently that has been incorporated into these maps. So this means that the new maps are much more accurate. Um, what does the town need to do? The town needs to adopt the firm or flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance study produced by AECOM and FEMA. And the town needs to adopt the zoning amendment and changes to the official zoning map. Um, planning department staff, along with uh, the building commissioner, with the assistance of our state flood hazard coordinator, Joy Dupero at DCR, has developed an amendment to the zoning bylaw. And that includes article two, Article 3 and Article 16, which we're calling FEMA Floodplain Overlay District. And we've developed a draft of an amendment to the official zoning map showing areas that will be included in the Floodplain Overlay District. The zoning amendment and changes to the zoning map have been pro uh, proposed because for municipalities that are part of the flood insurance program, we need to show that we can and do manage and control development in flood pr prone areas. So one of the things that we were missing back in uh, May and June was our letter of final determination. And we have finally received that from FEMA. That was dated August 9th, and we received it the following week. We expect that the final set of 
firm maps with new dates will be sent out probably tomorrow. And so we'll have it have them very shortly. However, the new maps are not available for this meeting. Um, the public hearings that were held in May and June were continued to this week in the expectation that we would receive the letter of final determination and the new firm maps. So we have one thing, but not the other. Um, therefore, we're recommending to you that you hold a discussion today about the material that you do have and then continue the public hearing on the zoning amendment and the changes to the official zoning map and on the firm maps and F FIS study to a date certain, probably sometime in October. The planning board held a continued public hearing session last night and they continued their public hearing to September 21st, um, but with the expectation that we'll have the new maps by that date. However, if we don't have them, the planning board has a backup plan to continue again to October 19th. Um, so what will happen if we don't adopt the flood maps? Uh, if the town fails to adopt the new maps, the town of Amherst will no longer be able to participate in the flood insurance program, and people in Amherst will not be able to purchase flood insurance through the flood insurance program. Um, in your packets in May, you received copies of presentations that Jennifer Moss of AECOM and Nate Malloy gave to town council in February, and they were a little more in depth describing what this project was all about and what the history of it is. So those um, presentations are still available if you're curious. Um, you can look on the town website in the planning board on the planning board webpage for the packet for June 1st of 2022. And I believe they were also included in the CRC packet for May 26th of 2022. Um, so anyway, we recommend that you use the time today to review the text of the proposed Article 16 floodplain overlay district, along with the texts of Article 2 and 3, and to review the outline of the floodplain overlay district, which um, we will show on the screen in a few minutes. Um, the map can also be viewed as, as an interactive map um, as posted online. I sent you a link to this or via Mandy. Um, I think we sent it out last week, so you may have had a chance to play around with that. It's a really good map because it gives you a lot of information about exactly where the differences are between the old floodplain maps and the new. Um, so after you've had a chance to um, ask your own questions and have a discussion and hear from the public, um, we recommend that you continue the public hearing to, to a date probably in October. Um, just to bring you up to date a little bit more, after the meetings at the end of May and beginning of June, um, some members of the planning board had questions and comments. Janet McGowan was one planning board member who had a lot of questions and comments and Nate and I met with her to discuss her comments and concerns on the earlier draft. And we incorporated um, many of her uh, comments into the new draft, but we also discussed some of her uh, concerns that um, ended up not being of concern to her. So we resolved the issues that she had brought up. Um, and we've revised the zoning amendment based on those comments, based on what we heard from CRC, and also based on what we heard from other planning board members. Um, there was an issue related to Tan Brook, and I'd like to just say a few words about that. Um, so we've heard from some residents and a few counselors that they have concerns about Tan Brook, um, the area in the center of town. And they were concerned that there was no flood plain shown along the Tanbrook in this area. And one panel in the center of town is blank and not included in the flood, flood plain mapping. Um, so FEMA has a threshold for mapping of uh, flood prone areas. Um, and they require that the uh, mapping be one square mile of watershed in order to be mapped on a FEMA map. Um, so the Tanbrook does not have an area of one square mile of watershed. The Conservation Commission has been discussing Tanbrook um, and they and DEP have been working on the issue of whether Tanbrook exceeds, whether the watershed exceeds one half square mile of watershed. And this relates to its potential designation as a perennial stream. Um, so this issue is different from whether the area qualifies for a firm map, firm mapping. Dave may have more to say about um, the issue that was brought to the Conservation Commission, but I just wanted to, to bring this up. Um, so aside from Tanbrook not having the 
uh, size of watershed that would qualify it to be mapped on a firm map. There's some other issues related to having your property mapped as a floodplain that I'd like to talk about. And anyone who owns property in a municipality that participates in the firm flood insurance program can purchase flood insurance. The property doesn't need to be mapped as a floodplain. Um, the second thing is that flood insurance only covers the building and its contents and not property on which the building sits. So some people in the Tanbrook area noticed, noticed flooding in their yards, but damage to their yards wouldn't be covered by flood insurance, only damage to the buildings. And the third thing is that um, in throughout the United States, most property owners would be more likely to request that their properties be taken out of the flood zone rather than being um, added to the flood zone for several reasons. Um, the first reason being that the value of the property may decrease as a result of being added to the flood zone. Um, the second reason is that properties in the flood zone may be required to purchase flood insurance in order to obtain a mortgage or a home equity loan. And the third thing is that properties in the flood zone would be subject to more scrutiny when making changes to the property, and they may need to apply to the Conservation Commission for permission to make changes. Um, since the 100 year floodplain is considered a wetland resource area. Now, the Conservation Commission has other ways of determining um, where flooding is likely to occur. So, even in places where um, the 100 year floodplain isn't mapped, I think that they can um, somehow establish jurisdiction over those areas. But those are things that I'm not um, completely familiar with, and Dave may have more information about that. So, in terms of the vote, that's needed, um, the adoption of the zoning bylaw portion of this project and changes to the official map require a two thirds vote of town council. And um, the CRC needs to make a rec recommendation to town council about these zoning amendments, just as it does about all zoning amendments. The adoption of the firm maps and the flood insurance study requires a majority vote of town council. Um, the CRC also needs to offer a recommendation on the firm maps and flood insurance study. I'm not planning to present the flood insurance study today, but you've received either you have received a um, link to it or you've received it already and you can read it at your leisure. It's quite a lengthy document that talks all about um, the methodology that the that AECOM used to establish the flood zones and it also gives um, uh, what should I say, cross sections of some of the um, of the streams showing where they took their data. So you might want to look at that. Um, so um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, about the introduction here. And if not, we can go into looking at the flood mapping and the um, <clears throat> text of the zoning amendment. Pam. Thank you. Um, just a couple quick questions. One is, um, does the six months that we have to approve all of this start as of August 9? Or does it start way back, you know, some of the earlier things? So I, I see Christine nodding her head. It so starts have... as of August 9, yes. Okay, or 9 or 12, whenever we receive the letter. Um, uh, you know, uh, did, did the planning board have any specific feedback that relative to the text or will you talk about that when we get into the text? Yes, we can talk about that when we get into the text. Okay, yeah. There great. wasn't too much feedback from the planning board, but they yeah. did have a few comments. Um, and, and I think well, my, my other question had to do with the text. So thank you, that was great. Any other questions before we get into the text? And we will not get into the maps until we continue this hearing and move to the next hearing, which is the overlay district. So we won't touch the overlay district. We'll do that last after we've done motions and reopened another hearing. Because Pam asked my question, which was what was the planning board feedback? So um, Chris, do you want me to just start with article two and then article three and then move to article 16? Yes, that'd be good, yep. Okay. Um, just looking, I, I'm sorry that Nate isn't able to join us today. He gave a really good presentation to the planning board last night and I'm, I listened again to his presentation. So I'm gonna to try to step into his shoes, but um, you'll have to bear with me because I'm not 
as expert in this as he is. Um, so we have to make changes to three sections of the zoning bylaw. The first section is Article 2, and Article 2 establishes the zoning districts. So we are in the process of establishing a new zoning district. So we have to describe that in Article 2. And we have um, the definition of this new zoning district. We're calling it the FEMA floodplain overlay district. And this is a, an overlay district intended to provide protection of and regulation of activities in the special flood hazard areas designated on the town of Amherst's flood insurance rate maps issued by the Federal Emergency Management Agency for the administration of the National Flood Insurance Program, the exact boundaries of which are defined by the 1% chance of base flood elevations shown on the firm and further defined by the flood insurance study and shown on the official zoning map for the town of Amherst entitled Official Zoning Map, Amherst, Massachusetts, May 2011, as amended. So I don't know if you want me to tell you what the planning board said about this, or do you want to ask questions first? Um, let's let's hear what the planning board thought about Article 2 before we ask any questions, because that might cover any questions we have. So one thing they asked was, um, why do we refer to the official zoning map dated May of 2011? And that was the date the town meeting um, voted to accept the electronic version of the official zoning map um, and established that as our official zoning map. Prior to that, we had had a series of paper maps which were based on the assessor's uh, property line maps. And um, now in May of 2011, we actually established the electronic map that you see online, the GIS map, as our official zoning map. And then we've added the phrase as amended to take care of any amendments that have happened since then. And obviously there have been amendments that have happened since then. So that was one of the questions. Um, another question was, um, how, how do we um, understand this 100-year uh, flood, mm, flood plain um, with a 1% chance of flooding in any given year? Um, and is that something that has been affected by climate change? And um, FEMA doesn't really uh, predict into the future what might happen. They base their um, analysis on previous flood events so and, and previous storms. So they look back in time and they've looked back, you know, from the time in the mid 70s until um, a few years ago, probably 2017 or 2019, somewhere in that area for um, data relating to flood events, and that's what they base their um, flood mapping on. So they're not looking forward into the future, but they're looking at collected data. They do have um, stream gauges that they use, and they did place stream gauges in Amherst um, during the time period when they were doing this analysis. So they have, um, you know, some relatively recent information. Um, but that's what they base their information on. They, they, don't, they don't put themselves in the position of predicting into the future. And that's um, a policy that they have across the country. Let's see, what else? Um, I think that's all the questions they had about this particular um, item here. Any further questions from CRC members? Pam. Chris, can you tell me, um, is there just going to be a new graphic overlay on the map, just like, uh, you know, flood protection zone or anything like that? Will, will it get a new color designation for that official map? Yes, that's right. Yep. So, oh, we weren't able to create that map yet. Um, Mike Warner is the person in IT who creates those maps. And he wasn't able to make the actual changes to the official zoning map yet because the town council hasn't voted for that. So once the town council votes for that, then he can create those um, changes to the official zoning map. But we will show you a map later on in this meeting that depicts where those lines will be. Any other questions on Article 2? Seeing none, we're going to move on to Article 3. And just so members of the public know, um, 
I will do questions after we've gone through all of the articles. Um, so. And these are article three. The items in bold are what is proposed to be changed. So in article three, um, we're dealing with use regulations and um, article three mentions flood ways and flood prone areas in two locations. The first one is in um, section 3.13, which relates to development in floodways. And it um, talks about that you can't encroach, including fill new construction improvements to existing structures, et cetera, um, unless there's a certification demonstrating that such encroachment will not result in any increase in flood levels. So we're not changing this existing language, which is all in uh, regular type. Um, the only thing we wanted to do is call people's attention to the fact that we do have another section that deals with floodways and floodplains. And so we've put in this additional phrase, see also Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district. So that's really what, what that first one is all about. In terms of the second um, item, 3.22, the flood prone conservancy district, I'm sure you all know that we ha already have um, a, a zoning district um, that deals with, um, it's a flood prone conservancy district. This district was established back in the 70s and it's based on um, not as accurate data as we have today for the FEMA floodplain mapping, but we didn't want to change anything about our FPC district because it's relatively um, complicated. It has, um, it is not an overlay district. It's an actual base district. So in other words, if you were to remove the flood prone conservancy district from a property, you would then need to figure out, well, what zone do you want to put in that, in place of that? And so for all of the properties in town that are, um, encompassed by the flood prone conservancy district. We didn't think that this time was a good time to make those individual decisions about all those different properties. So we've left the flood prone conservancy district in place for now. We may choose to make amendments to it in the future, but for now we're just adding this sentence that says, uh, oh, the other thing is that in some places, the flood prone conservancy district is more restrictive than FEMA. So what we've said here is that the floodplain management regulations found in the new article, Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district, shall take precedence over any less restrictive conflicting provision of this bylaw or other local bylaw regulation or code. So in other words, if the FPC district is more restrictive than the FEMA floodplain res, uh, regulations won't touch those more restricted um, regulations. But again, we wanted to call people's attention to the fact that Article 16 exists and they, they should take a look at it. So. Any questions regarding the proposed amendments to Article 3? Uh, Chris, did did the planning board have any uh, requests to amend these two proposed amendments? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Seeing none, we're going to move on to the bulk of the um, uh, proposed amendments. So we've created a new uh, zoning bylaw, Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district. And we presented this to you in uh, May, and then we presented it to the planning board in June. And since then, as I said, um, we met with um, Janet McGowan and we incorporated her comments to the extent that we felt that they were, um, how can I say this, uh, useful, helpful. Um, and she is fine with this latest draft. Um, and she was very helpful in helping us to think about wording and how to make things clearer. Um, so uh, it also incorporates any changes that the CRC or the planning board asked for at their meetings back in May and June. 
Um, so the first thing has to do with the intent and purpose. And um, item 16.02, um, we've added the words occurrence of public emergencies. So we're trying to prevent the occurrence of public emergencies and then also contamination pollution of water resources resulting in flooding. So that was something that we um, added to this uh, text here. And that seems to make sense to us. We've also added a new purpose down at the bottom, which is to allow the floodplain to operate naturally and drain floodwaters without excessive development that can add to flooding. So the comment that we received from the planning board here was that we really don't need the word excessive in this um, purpose here. We can delete the word excessive because um, we don't want any development in the floodplain that would um, promote flooding, that would add to flooding. So we're going to take out that word excessive. Um, so do you want to keep going? To definition, um, are there any questions about questions. this? We'll do questions by section. Um, so intent and purpose. My only comments are just Scrivener type things. I just noticed that purpose is spelled wrong. Oh. Um, and when you added the new section, the the and and all just needs pop down. Yeah. The semicolon's now in the wrong spot. So. Yep. Okay. No other questions. We'll move on to definitions. Oh, and I just wanted to state for clarification. The red that you see is the changes from the last version we saw. Everything you're looking at is what we would be voting to adopt, though, not just the red, in case there's anyone out there that that is used to seeing, oh, red is the what you're seeking to change. No, red is just showing us the difference between the last time we looked and now, but the whole thing is new. Yep. So in terms of definitions, we want to make the point strongly that these definitions apply only to Article 16. They don't apply to any other portion of the zoning bylaw. And I think that was confusing to people because there are definitions in here that could apply to other sections of the zoning bylaw unless we make this specific. Um, so we've put the that we, we've left the phrase in that starts off this section. Um, at the recommendation of Joy Dupro, our um, contact at the state, we've taken out reference to flood hazard boundary map because we don't have a flood hazard boundary map for Amherst. Um, in terms of the floodway, um, there were uh, questions about confusion as to what is a floodway and what does the uh, reference to height um, refer to. And so we put in the words as shown on the approved firm maps because the firm maps do show um, particular height in different locations. So those show what we expect to have as the surface elevation in those particular locations. Um, so just that was just a clarification. Now the the number or the wording in brackets. If you, Mandy Jo goes back up. Uh, there were questions about these wordings in brackets. Now, the state model bylaw had included those to help cities and towns um, understand where these words came from, where these definitions came from. Um, we, uh, after hearing from the planning board and Janet agreed with this, that um, we should take those out and our state uh, coordinator has also said we can take those out and just make a general reference to the particular codes and um, federal regulations in the first uh, portion of this article 16. So in the introductory paragraph, we're going to make um, a reference to these codes. It doesn't make sense to make them uh, throughout this um, this document and the other problem would be that um, the numbers of the codes may change and then we would have to go back in and change the numbers and we'd have to get town council to vote to change the numbers so that is a very cumbersome way of dealing with this so everyone agreed that we could take out those references and just put a general statement about those um, particular regulations in the beginning part of the zoning bylaw. So that was something that was just agreed upon last night. So we haven't had a chance to incorporate the exact wording. Okay, thank you, Chris. Pam? Yeah, Chris, uh, the question on the the paragraph starting with the floodway, um, why don't we use the word designated elevation rather than designated height? I mean, we don't have, we don't have depth of water measure, measured. We have 
water up to certain elevation. That's a good point. Yeah. So we'll check that with our coordinator at the state and see if that is acceptable to I FEMA. Mean, the, the sentence the sentence says without cumulatively increasing the water surface elevation more than a designated I guess they're talking about a designated height over the elevation that the water surface is already uh, yeah right yeah yeah I, so, I get it. yeah um okay the other changes in definition were down at start of construction so the start of construction was one big run on sentence really, or one big run on paragraph. And it was very hard to parse out what exactly does this mean? So um, we've separated things out a bit and we've said that, um, you know, there's the date of issuance of a building permit for new construction or substantial improvements to existing. We added the word or and or um, improvements that seemed to make sense. And then we've made the statement that um, we've we've reworded things here. The actual start of construction must commence within 180 days of the issuance of a building permit, and that's kind of standard. Um, the a building permit expires if you don't use it within 180 days. You are um, free to apply to renew the building permit, but you need to use it within that six month period. Um, and then the rest of this language is what you've seen before. So we're not in conflict with with anything else in our in our bylaws about permit permits being granted and time frames. Well, again, this language only applies to Article 16, That's right. so that we don't have to um, consider that possible conflict. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to section. Okay, um, top of this page, there are just one one small thing again. Um, this is something Janet helped us with. Um, again, it was a kind of a run on sentence and it was hard to understand it. So we've separated it out into two sections, A and B, to make it easier to read. But the wording is essentially the same as it was before. So that was just a clarification. Um, so, again, so again, excuse me, sorry to interrupt. So again, these, these repairs or, or even some construction that may be allowed I guess we're covering the we're covering the sort of the grandfathered in building that that was allowed or was built within this this flood floodable area. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, our current regulations have wetland you know wetland regulations don't allow you to typically build that close to these areas. So this is just sort of covering our covering the base of of existing conditions. Is that that right? is true. And also, it is true that FEMA allows people to build in the floodplain. What they do is they say, well, if you're going to build in the floodplain, you have to build your building, you know, on stilts and get it up out of the flood area. And we don't allow that. So, um, so yes, this applies to previously existing buildings. Um, Section 6. 16.2 .2, designation of the floodplain administrators. So um, if you go up just to the beginning of this section, um, Mandy Jo, um, what we're doing here is FEMA requires that there be a position in the town that is designated as the floodplain administrator. So in this case, we've chosen to designate the planning director as the floodplain administrator. It could be the town engineer, it could be the wetlands administrator. It could be, you know, the town manager, but to us, it made sense to make the planning director the floodplain administrator because the planning director has access to all of the other department heads in town, and also the planning director has a staff. So the planning director has the ability to contact other people who might be helpful in administering this floodplain bylaw, and also has the ability to um, en enlist help from her staff or his staff. Um, and that would be as opposed to say the wetlands administrator who was suggested as the person to deal with this. The wetlands administrator um, 
doesn't have a staff and the particular wetlands administrator who is currently in that position um, was not um, enthusiastic about taking on this role. So um, we've decided that the planning director would be the appropriate uh, person to do that. And again, it's really the role of a coordinator where the planning director figures out kind of what needs to be done and then gets the people who need to do it moving in the direction that they need to move. Um, so that's that was the reason here. And if the planning director is absent, um, their designee would fulfill the duties. And in the case of our department, the designee would be um, the senior planner. And in this case, it's Nate Malloy. Um, so that's that's what this is all about. And then um, the duties of the floodplain administrator, the initial language of the model bylaw said the duties include, and we thought, well, the duties may change over time. So we should say may include, and these are the things that we think that may be included. Um, the the, the uh, representative at the state, Joy Dupereau said, we didn't really even need to state all of these different things, but we thought it would be helpful to people reading the bylaw to know a little bit more about, well, what does the floodplain administrator do anyway? And this is just an attempt to describe some of the things that the floodplain administrator would do. So that's what that's all about. Um, let's see. I have one question before we get to regulations. Mm. It always worries me when we put addresses in bylaws because addresses can change and then we have to change the bylaw. Mm. So is it necessary to put these addresses in or can it just be changes to FEMA region one risk analysis and a copy to Massachusetts NFIP state coordinator? I think you don't need to put the addresses in. Any other questions before we move on to regulations? Regulations. Okay, so in terms of regulations, we've discovered or d confirmed, I guess, by speaking with the wetlands administrator that anything that happens in the FEMA floodplain, which is the 100 year floodplain, comes under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. So um, the 100 year floodplain is equivalent to the FEMA floodplain overlay district, they're the same thing. So anytime someone wants to do something in the floodplain, in the 100 year floodplain, they have to get, they at least have to tell the wetlands administrator what they're doing so that the wetlands administrator can determine if this thing actually needs conservation commission approval. So say somebody was making um, minor changes to a house or a building that's in the floodplain, but these minor changes don't affect um, the land around it at all. Um, our permitting system, which we now have this thing called OpenGov, notifies everybody when a permit application comes in. So say someone wants to you know, change the door on a building that's in the floodplain. Well, the, the wetlands administrator would get a notification of that and she would say, well, that doesn't need to go to the Conservation Commission. On the other hand, if somebody wanted to make a driveway to a building that's in the floodplain, that would need to go to the Conservation Commission because that is actually um, an alteration of the floodplain and the Conservation Commission would have to decide, is that something that's going to increase the chance of flooding in this area? Or is it something that actually is completely flat and contiguous with the surrounding land? So, so that's why we've said here that any work in the FEMA floodplain overlay district shall require review by the wetlands administrator. And then that person will determine if review by the conservation commission is required. And that's how we've, um, we've dealt with this. Now, some cities and towns have a checklist where they have a number of different things that someone has to do in order to you know, get get through this process. But we realized, having talked to a couple of places, particularly Waitley, that trying to establish a checklist is really a daunting process because it's really hard to imagine all the different um, 
permits that you might need to do something. And I can kind of list them in my head, but I'm sure they're not inclusive. So we decided not to um, state it that way, but really to um, require the applicant to state that he had indeed, you know, acquired all of these um, all of these permits, and I think we did state that somewhere, somewhere in here. Maybe it's in the previous paragraph. Well, it's been removed here. Mm, there's another statement about it. In addition to it, here it is. In addition to any building permit or other local, state, or federal permits, any development. Oh, mm, no, it's up there. Go, keep going up. No, it, I mean, it, it's here. It says. OK, it requires. A permit. Yeah. Permit. Okay, the proponent obtained that's all local, state, all and necessary. federal permits necessary in order to carry out the proposed work. So that's where we state that the it's on the it's a responsibility of the proponent to obtain all of these permits. Okay. Um. And the last thing, I think it's the last thing, maybe not, um, in subdivision approvals. Well, um, the FEMA, so I should say that um, the, the letter that we received, the letter of final determination refers to a section of the um, federal code. And I've read that section of the federal code, but what um, our state has done is it's taken the federal code and it's translated in into this model bylaw which we've used and they have um, incorporated the different things that the federal um, code requires so one of the things is a subdivision approval needs to be reviewed and we of course always review subdivision approvals, uh, subdivision proposals, and it, they're reviewed by town staff, and then they are put through a process with the planning board or whichever board and committee it needs to see it. So that's why we've said here that subdivision approvals shall be reviewed by town staff if they're in the overlay district. Well, they're always reviewed by town staff, and then we have um, some other things listed below, which are things that you've already seen. Um, so that was just a, a kind of a clarification. Um, let's uh, before we move on, Pam. Yeah, quick question. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a little redundant because in other sections you say, you know, you have to um, identify that you're not increasing the blockage within the waterway or with the, in, the, in the drainage. So to have to say it again for the subdivision as well, it seems a little redundant, but, um, it's probably better to be a little over inclusive than under inclusive. I think that's true, especially since what's going to happen here is that after the town adopts this bylaw, it gets sent to the state for their review and then it gets sent to FEMA. And we don't want any glitches when it gets to FEMA because we want the FEMA approval to occur within that six month period. And if we have something that we've taken out that they say, you got to put it back in, then you know that's going to complicate the approval process. So I would say if they suggest or want us to put this in, let's put it in and you know call it a day. Yep. Thank you. A um, couple more changes. Hmm? Just, Base flood elevation data. Yeah. Oh, this was something that was really confusing. When proposing subdivisions and other developments greater than 50 lots, initially it said, or five acres, whichever is less. And we kept trying in our minds to think about what does that mean? So in the end, we just put anything greater than five, 50 lots or five acres the proponent must provide technical data. Now, that would definitely be true anyway in Amherst. And maybe it's not true, you know, because this, this type of bio, or this type of regulation applies in Idaho and it applies in, you know, Alabama and Florida and all of these places that are not as well regulated as Massachusetts. So we have a lot of these things in place already. So we felt comfortable just changing this to say, you know, developments, greater than 50 lots and or five acres, you got to provide this information. And then you have addresses here again. Addresses, okay. 16.37. Yep. Delete, okay. 
Yep. Um, okay, so this was a suggestion that was mm, recreational vehicles. Oh, yeah, so you're allowed to have recreational vehicles in the flood zone, um, provided they are you know, that you can move them out out of the flood zone easily. They have to be elevated and anchored, um, but they also have to be on um, wheels, I think. But that's all covered in the federal regulations. Um, so we're, we've said in accordance with FEMA's flood zone regulations. Um, so whatever FEMA requires, we're requiring here for uh, recreational vehicles. I don't think we actually have regular recreational vehicles in flood zones in Amherst, but I know Hadley does. And they had a lot of conversation about that a few years ago. Um, okay, what are course alterations or relocation of riverine areas? We don't really do this in Amherst. We don't relocate our rivers. Um, but in the case that we did, we're required to notify some entities so we have to notify the adjacent towns and the bordering states and the uh, national flood insurance program state coordinator and program specialist so again we can delete the addresses um, but we wanted to make sure that it was any any suggestion that we're going to move these proposed or actual but we don't think this is going to happen in amherst um let's see state regulations so the, so the floodplain administrator um, if someone gets a variance from um, floodplain standards which we think would be rare um, then the floodplain administrator is required to notify the property owner that their flood insurance policy may become more expensive as a result of the variance so that's what this is about and initially it said um, that this letter should be issued in writing over the signature of a community official, but then that was kind of vague. So we said, well, why don't we just say it's gonna be the floodplain administrator who issues this letter of warning the proponent who's you know, obtaining the variance that, you know, if you get this variance, your flood insurance rates are probably gonna go up. Um, and then we have to maintain the letter in our files. So that made, made sense to us. Just a Scrivener, that second paragraph in there that starts the floodplain administrator, the shall is shall is held over from something where it started a sentence. <laughs> shall should be shall. Okay, invariances. And we are almost through. This is the last two sets. Okay, and then let's see. Um, the variant, if however, a variance shall not be issued within any designated regulatory floodway if then we put these words in to make the sentence make sense. If the variance would result in an increase in flood levels, those words just seem to make that sentence read better. And that's what we're talking about. Um, and then in the sec section on enforcement, um, the floodplain administrator doesn't really have power to enforce things, but the building commissioner does have power to enforce things. So we're putting the building commissioner in here as the person who would enforce the regulations. And the building commissioner has the power to, um, to impose a fine or a penalty of up to $300. Um, so we thought this was a better situation. Building commissioner agrees and our uh, person at the state said that this was a fine thing to do and it kept it it kept the enforcement of this section of the bylaw in line with the sec other sections of the bylaw which are also enforced by the building commissioner so that's yeah. um thanks that's really good explanation uh it occurs to me that a 300 dollars fine for somebody building in you know, illegally in a, in a waterway is a fairly light um uh, it's a fairly light fine, and and I think anyone who's dealing with wetland zones should be totally aware of you know the impact. I wonder if a heftier fine would be um, appropriate and and acceptable by other people. Well, the three hundred dollars a day is actually kind of standard throughout our regulations. Um, and I think it's true of the general bylaw as well as the zoning bylaw. And it is a daily um, fine, so it does build up over time. Um, each day is a, considered a different offense. So um, even though I agree that 
you know, violating this would be a serious offense. Um, I think that to keep it in line with other things that we do, the $300 a day um, seems like the right amount. So I, I believe it's subject to the same maximum that all of our general bylaw $300 fines are, which is you can't, as a municipality, do more than $300 per any offense, which is why you declare each day a separate offense so that they can build up because 300 is the highest we can go. Jennifer, did that answer your question? Yes, and also because the day appears in the next sentence. So actually, when I first heard it, I was concerned it was just $300 but it's per day, per offense, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's why we always state each day yeah. as a separate violation because that's how you build up right. to make it, as Pam says, a little, a little more, more reasonable in size given the damage it would do. Um, yeah. Any other questions, concerns, things about this bylaw, even though we've heard that we're probably continuing this hearing because there might be further changes and we're waiting for the final firm maps. Um, I, I want to get us through as much as we can this time so that the next time we hear this, we're as quick as we can be. So Pam. Any, can we do any public comment on this now? Or uh, we... If there's no more questions from us, we'll move to public comments and then come back. Um, okay. So I'm going to stop the share, seeing that there aren't any, because we are in a hearing. So um, we, we have to have public comment and public questions. So at this time, we're going to move to questions from the public which is different than comments. If you've got a question that you would like one of us to answer, most likely Chris, because um, she's the most knowledgeable, uh, please raise your hand at this time and we will recognize you in turn. And just, just so people know, we have one person in attendance right now. Um, seeing no hands, if anyone has a comment on the three sets of changes we have um, just been through Article 2, Article 3, and the new Article 16, please raise your hand. Seeing none. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns, requested changes to any of the things we just um, reviewed? Pam. I just want to say thanks to Christine and the staff because this is <laughs> this has been a long process. And um, I you very carefully turned over each of these stones and sort of followed it out to the ends of the of the leads. And um, and thanks for the, the good coordination with all the state level uh, folks that are leading this this charge as well. So um, I appreciate all the hard work. Thank you. Thanks for those words, Pam. So my next question is, we had originally thought, Chris and I, when I asked her when are a reasonable date to continue the hearing to, because we don't have the final study and the final maps, and therefore the zoning overlay could potentially change. And so we don't want to make any recommendation until we've got everything finalized from FEMA. She had suggested maybe October 27th because of when the planning board might continue their hearing to. Um, but if the planning board's gone to September 21st, Chris, do you think it would be reasonable for us to just continue this two weeks? I know we're on that time deadline, so I don't want us continuing too far out if you think we can get this done on the 22nd of September. What is your thoughts on that, Chris? So the planning board is sort of taking a leap of faith that they can do something on the 21st. They have a public hearing on an archipelago project 47 Olympia Drive that same night. Um, I think they can get this done in, you know, not much time at all because they've already heard it so many times. Um, so I would say it's quite possible that they could finish it on the 21st. And then if you had your hearing um, continued to the 22nd, you would be able to wrap it up on the 22nd. But I'm just letting you know that because of the of the particular case that's on before this on the 21st, you know, it's possible that we may not fully wrap this up, but it's a good bet that we could. Are, are we sure the final um, study and firm maps will be issued in the next week? <laughs> Based on past um, performance, I wouldn't, I wouldn't guarantee it. 
So, um, you know, what the planning board did and essentially was say, okay, we'll continue our public hearing to the 21st. And then if for some reason the map does maps don't come in or we're overburdened on the 21st, we can always continue to our next meeting, which would be October 19th. Um, so you might choose to take the same uh, path and say, okay, you'll continue this to the 22nd, but then if that doesn't work out for some reason, you'll go to your next meeting, which I think would be October 13th. Is that right? No, um, our next meeting is October 13th, which is before the planning board would hear it. Um, the one after that is the 27th. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Right. If we're trying to hear it after the planning board makes their recommendation, right. which I personally, I think is ideal is waiting until we've got the planning board recommendation so that they've made any changes to the language that they want. Um, so that sounds like I'm going to make a motion um, to continue this public hearing until uh, September 22nd at 4.30 p.m. Is there a second? Pam Rooney raised her hand for the second. Uh, any conversation? Seeing none, we're going to vote. Um, Shalini. You need to unmute Shalini. Yes. Um, Mandy is an I. Um, Pam. Yes. And Jennifer. I. That is the unanimous um, vote to continue the hearing to September 22nd at 4.30 p.m. Um, now at 5.36 p.m., we are opening the continued public hearing on the zoning bylaw official zoning map FEMA floodplain overlay district um, that was continued from May 26, 2022. And this is to see if the town will vote to amend the official zoning map to add the FEMA floodplain overlay district for the purpose of regulating activities as described in Article 16 FEMA floodplain overlay district. Um, and so let me share this. And again, we will go through this um, There's a link. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's this one, but it should be that. Um, there we go. Okay, so. So this map is um, something that was created by our IT staff, and it shows um, the new uh, floodplain um, configuration in blue, and it shows the 1983 floodplain configuration in yellow. And so the two things are overlaid with each other, and it's a map of the entire town. And you can um, move it around, and you can um, zoom in on it and it's it's really quite useful um you can see by looking at this particular location and what is this location this is Holly this is brook. heatherstone brook and holly brook i can zoom out i just thought it was a nice one um above this oh, is i this see is where this is yeah this, this is, is amethyst road. so it's pelham above road. amethyst going east west and then this yeah. is north of pelham road and it's behind a lot of those farm properties and you can see that pelham is over to the east over to the right um so this gives a good impression of the differences between the um old map which was based on 10-foot contours and not as good um, technical data and the new map which is based on one foot contour so it's the new map is obviously much more refined um, a, a cool thing about this is that you can go back and forth between the maps i won't show you that right now because i don't know how to get out of it um, unfortunately i'm technically disabled but um in any event, you can see the difference between the two maps here very, very starkly. But I think it would be helpful to go to some places that we know, like Pomeroy Village, if Mandy can um, move this so that we can have the intersection of Pomeroy Lane and Route 116. And so Pomeroy Village is right here. And you have, um, if you zoom out just a tiny bit, um, you can see that Hickory Ridge Country Club or not country club, golf 
course, whatever it's called now, um, is primarily in the floodplain. So that's really, um, you know, a clear ind indication of what's going on over in that property. But the area right around Pomeroy Lane, right around the intersection is also good to look at. And Mandy might um, zoom in on that particular intersection just a bit. Um, and yeah, that's that's terrific. So you can see the difference between the old map and the new map in this location. You can see the yellow was very sort of generalized and um, smooth, and it didn't really reflect the jaggedness of uh, contour elevations. And there are two buildings here right in the middle of this picture. Um, one is R&P Liquor and the other one is that uh, mixed use building. So those two buildings were initially shown as being in the floodplain. In fact, those two properties are elevated. So they're actually out of the floodplain. And you can see that clearly in the blue area. The blue area is the new uh, floodplain. So those two properties are not within the floodplain. So that's a case where um, somebody who might have had to buy flood insurance in the past may not have to buy it in the future as a result of these new maps. Um, let's see what would be another place that we could look at. We could look at North Amherst um, up around um, <clears throat> the Mill River Recreation Area, and that would be a good place to go. Um, so that's right here, and this is interesting to look at um, because you can see that the, uh, there's a lot of floodplain in this um, in this village center. Um, the yellow again is the old flood map, and the blue is the new flood map. So that little um, shopping center that contains the pizza place and the uh, post office and combis that used to be in the floodplain that is no longer in the floodplain based on our new analysis of topography, um, and also parts of the um, Mill River Conservation Area that used to be within the floodplain are not in the floodplain anymore. So that is um, revealing. And then um, there are some properties over to the west of Sunderland Road that have um, that would have less of an issue with flood zone, now, flood district now. Um, if you look at the properties just west of Sunderland Road, you'll see that the area has shrunk. So that would be um, right, right to the left of where it says Mill River, that area there. Yep. So that has shrunk. On the other hand, the area to the west of 116 has grown um, dramatically. So that area was was not as big as it was as it is now. But now we've um, remapped that area and all of that is really within the flood plain. So, um, you know, and that includes the new marijuana place up there and, and a lot of that land. Um, so that's really uh, significant. Um, there was a controversial property down below the intersection of Meadow Street and Route 116, um, which you might want to look at because this might be brought up by members of the public. But um, so Ron Verdier and what's his name? Lee Andrews. Uh, Ron Laverdier's father and Lee Andrews own a chunk of property here, sort of a triangular shape that is um, bordered by the farm to the south, Route 116 to the east, and Meadow Street, which turns into Russellville Road to the west. And you can see that the area that they have available to them to develop, um, it used to be all pretty much all yellow which was the 1983 flood map. And now some of that is um, removed from the flood map. And the area in blue is what is considered to be the 100 year floodplain. So that's an interesting um, Christine, interesting change. Is that, the, is that the light industrial area? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this still has flood prone conservancy district on it. And so that further restricts ability to develop this property, but I just wanted to point this out to you because it was somewhat controversial back in, um, when was that, 2000, somewhere between 2001, 2003, I think there was a lawsuit about this property and about its designation as flood prone conservancy. So this is the way um, FEMA has determined that the actual flood plain lies on that property. So um, I, I actually think Pam, Pam, I don't think this is light industrial over here. I think the light industrial zoning is, is up here. Is. 
no, it is. There is a little chunk of light industrial on that property that oh. we were just looking at. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think you can get to the zoning map from here, but there are two little areas of um, of light industrial that are right along the road. And those are places that Ron Lavertier had actually gotten permitted to build two buildings and he never built them. So those permits have expired. But um, I think he's still interested in developing parts of this property. So that may okay. that may come about. Um, are there any other places in town that people are interested in looking at? Just shout it out. If you do, I can move. I think it's all pretty cool. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? It's so much fun to look at. I had stuff. fun browsing the whole thing at a high resolution this morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, but I guess one thing I would say is I am very impressed at how few buildings are within our floodplains, even with these new drawn maps. And so I, I would say that's probably a kudos to whoever did the floodplain conservancy district, which probably helped in the 70s, 80s, and 90s stop some building in what has now been deemed flood area. Um, even places that weren't flood, you know, were, weren't yellow the last time we did this and are now blue. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that brings up something that I did want to mention, and it was something that Nate um, talked about in his presentation last night. So, the 1983 floodplain includes um, 500 properties and over 400 structures that are within the floodplain. And as a result of the new map, we still have, I think, around 450 properties that are. Um, included in the floodplain, but we only have 70 structures. So that makes sense because, you know, people tended to build their structures on higher ground, but the um, 1983 maps didn't capture those minor changes in topography. So we only have 70 structures, roughly 70 structures in town that are currently within the floodplain. So that's an interesting statistic. And maybe several recreational vehicles, but we don't know. Maybe so, <laughs> although I haven't seen any. <laughs> any other questions on the map? Okay, again, we're going to go to um, the public. Um, if there are any questions from the public on the map, please raise your hand at this time. Seeing no questions, if there's any comments from the public on the map. Um, Please raise your hand at this time. Seeing none, any other further questions from the committee? So uh, just to yep. let you know, the blue areas on the map that we just looked at those are going to be the areas that will be included in the official zoning map as the overlay district. Okay. Sounds good. Um, seeing nothing else, we're going, I'm going to make the motion to continue the public hearing until September 22nd at 4 35 PM. Is there a second? Second. Jennifer seconds that any further questions or discussion on the motion to continue? Pam. Yeah, were, were we planning to actually vote on um, articles two and three or 16 at this time um, before, you know, even without without closing the public hearing? No, um, we will be doing the votes after the public hearings are closed, um, but we're trying to get as much of that discussion done now so okay. that we can move efficiently when we can finally close the hearings because we've got the final things. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and that's presuming that the final ones that come in are not vastly changed from what we've seen, right? Which is why we don't want to close the hearings because we don't know. Um, and so we might have questions if they change something dramatically. Seeing no other questions, um, we're going to vote. Mandy is an aye. Pam? Aye. Uh, Jennifer? Aye. And Shalini? Yes. That is the public hearing is um, continued to the 22nd at 4.35 p.m. 
Um, with that, we're going to move on to our action items. Um, and, and in the vein of what I just described, um, we are not going to discuss the proposed amendments. Um, um, we can have a discussion. We're not going to get to a vote. Um, I think we've probably given everyone's comments already had the discussion. Um, but if anyone would like to on action item 4A, which is the amendments to the bylaw and the zoning map, um, talk about anything now before we um, move on to the next item. Um, Chris. I just wanted to encourage you all to look at the flood insurance study that's posted online because um, you are going to be asked to vote on that. And it's hard to present because it's all about methodology and stream cross sections, et cetera. Which was going to be the next thing we talk about because that's 3B, the rate maps and the insurance study. Okay. Um, so the zoning things, does, does anyone have any? Thing to add to a discussion or anything before we move on to the rate maps and insurance study. Seeing none, um, we will be back with that item on our agenda next meeting. Um, the next item on our agenda is the flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance study. The study is online. I think I forgot to put it directly in the packet. It has been in a council packet before, so we've seen it. I just think I forgot to move it over. Um, and the rate maps um, are, I believe, the ones we've seen in the past that were in the packet. They're the ones that de designate the A and the AE sections and all, right, which is different than the overlay that we just looked at in how it's designated, but not in where. Is that correct, Chris? The borders are exactly the same as what you've just seen. They're just shown on panels. They're shown on individual panels and you've seen them previously, but you've seen them with dates that are out of date and you are going to get these maps in with dates that are actually dated February 9th of 2023 and those will be the maps that you will be asked to adopt. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions on the insurance study that we've seen in the past or the rate maps? Um, I will make sure to forward that study. Um, I, I will create the packet for next week's meeting today. <laughs> it's basically gonna be today's packet, um, but I'll make sure to put the study in and a link to the rate maps so you can see the labels. Um, but any questions on those or discussion on adoption, we're not gonna vote until we have the final versions from FEMA. And final text. Seeing no questions, um, I want to thank Chris for her patience with us um, and working through this. Um, 2017 to now and multiple <laughs> studies and multiple maps and multiple appeals. Um, it's been a process and we're we're in the home stretch. I, I think we can finally see an end for you guys. Um, so thank you for all your patience with us and, and helping us learn what it all means and how to interpret and look at and answering all our questions. We will see you in two weeks, um, mm -hmm. hopefully okay. to make a recommendation <laughs> because hopefully we'll have FEMA's, their, their role in this done. Are you um, holding a public hearing on these last two things right now? No, we don't need to hold a public hearing on the okay. insurance study and okay. the rate maps because it's yeah, not that's zoning. Right. Yeah. Um, that's right. Yep. And so it's just on our agenda as an action item. Um, as you can see, there hasn't been a lot of public interest with the two hearings we've held and no comments at all. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll, we'll keep holding the hearings and keep the comments coming But um, if they come. But yeah, we haven't scheduled specific hearings for these because it's not required. Okay. And FEMA spends this much time in towns across the country. So may I answer that? Yes, yeah. you may. So normally towns don't set out to change their own FEMA maps. Normally mm -hmm. FEMA comes along and says, you're gonna change your maps or some regional group gets together and changes their maps. And in fact, there's a process now going on. Um, the Connecticut Valley watershed is 
their maps are being changed and our maps will be incorporated into those maps but that was a process that hadn't started when we started our process so we set out on our own because we realized that there were issues about our maps and we wanted more definitive you know accurate maps so so we're kind of a i don't know an outlier or a first first uh, adapter or doctor, whatever you want to call it, we took the leap and we we're doing it on our own with the help of FEMA and our state rep. But it's not a typical thing that cities and towns okay. do. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Any so, other questions? So doubly thank you. Yeah, <laughs> lots of thank yous. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before we, Rob has just joined us. So what we're going to do is we have, Rob has joined us about on time. Um, we have to do associate member vacancies. That should be really quick. And then we'll probably spend about 20 minutes on rental, residential rental bylaw before we do general public comment and the minutes. Um, it's not a long time, but we're going to use the time because we've got a lot to do. So associate member vacancies on the ZBA, as everyone knows, we posted the bulletin board notice about a month ago. Um, a little over a month ago, almost five weeks ago. Right now, um, there are technically four applicants. Um, we have not, we can't seek statements of interest until after we declare a pool sufficient. So we do not know whether any of those applicants will submit statements of interest. Um, we have three associate member vacancies. Um, so I put this on here not to necessarily seek a vote of sufficiency, although if this committee believes it is a sufficient pool for members for four applicants for three vacancies, we can take a vote. Um, but I wanted to sort of make sure we haven't forgotten that there's a bulletin board notice out there and that we're hoping to get applicants. Um, so yeah, so those four applicants, um, only two of those four um, submitted SOIs after um, the votes on the previous appointments. Um, so, so in other words, two of those four applicants are applicants because we sought the waiver to accept applicants up to um, May 1, even though the bulletin board notice did not get published till August 1. Um, so Jennifer. Yeah, last time, didn't we um, know who the applicants were to see whether it was sufficient in terms of, you know, diversity and... So uh, I can, I can uh, you can go look um, because everyone gets sent the community activity form. Um, so if you go back into your email, you can, right, find, can find it. the right. most recent four, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, or the most recent five, one of the one of the ones that is more recent was appointed. Um, and so was already a member. But um, you can go back in that. Um, I tend to only do that that true compilation when I think it might be sufficient, oh, okay. um, you know, to save a little bit of time. Right. Um, but um, if people are want to um, want to consider whether four applicants for three positions is sufficient, um, we, we can, I, I can't share it, but I can point you to where that information is um, for you to look at. Um, it won't, it won't be a yeah. special document, right. but, but there are four. Um, I think in the past we've disclosed um, gender and age and stuff. Um, I think they're all male. Was that on the application they usually? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Demographic information that we put in our report is on the application. Um, and so that includes age, languages spoken, and um, self-identified gender. Yeah. And then usually where they live in town. Yeah. They, they tend to put an address too. Right. So, so we can look at the addresses too. And when are we wanting to hold interviews? So we haven't aimed for any specific date. Um, Pam yeah, and I have, have discussed, you know, we need a pool, right? And then we need to survey the pool once we've got a pool to see when they're available. Pam and I did discuss um, potentially, what did we say, October at the earliest, yeah. Pam? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but if we don't have a, if we don't declare pools sufficient, those obviously have to get pushed back because it just does take a little bit to schedule and get people to respond to scheduling and all. Um, but it would be wonderful if we could get interviews done in October and appointments done by that first November council meeting. Um, you know, because at this point we are operating, the ZBA is operating with one associate member and four, four mem five members. So they have a complete complement of members and then one sub um, basically. But as we all know, um, the chair would love to have more subs. Pam, your hand is still up. So question, um, I think we requested uh, of town council that, um, let's see, how did that go? That um, we were going to accept applications or the people that wouldn't have to redo a, 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 calf, a, a calf if they had submitted it after May 1. And I, and I didn't think that we actually voted on that in town council. It was on consent and all of our consent, waivers have passed right. on consent. Right. So thank you. So thank yeah, you. that number of four includes everyone from May 1 forward that is not currently sitting on the board. Questions, comments? All I would do is encourage, I'll make the announcement at the council meeting on Monday, encourage everyone to continue letting people know um, that we're seeking applicants. Um, and at some point we may have to move forward like we kind of did last time um, without necessarily thinking a pool is sufficient, but not wanting to keep things as open as they are. Um, but we can have that discussion now or later. But I think we still have a little bit of time to try. Other thoughts? We have, a, we have another discussion next week, next, next, next. I think next week's agenda, I'm just going to change the date on this week's agenda and, and post it because um, and change the minutes. Um, but yeah, I will I will put it, it will be back on the agenda. Um, okay, next up is our residential rental bylaw, um, review of the bylaw language in the working draft, focusing on inspections and other requirements to obtain licenses, violations, penalties, and issuance or denial of permits. Thank you, Rob, for coming. Um, and I am actually kind of on time, so <laughs> I'm impressed by my my um, estimate of when we might get to this. So um, let me see if I can pull that one up, because um, I just want us to move right into um, the the document um, as we start moving through these. The, the language. And so we had marked, this is changed from the last time we saw it based on our conversations that at the last meeting, um, but we did not get through everything. So we're going to start with where we ended last time and not look at today, since we have such minimal time, um, the changes that were made between it based on those conversations. We're going to start where we didn't get through, which is, um, the disclosure notifications and then um, consent. And then let's see, um, suspension revocation procedures and beyond. So we're gonna start with suspension revocation procedures beyond and then move back to consent and other disclosure notifications. Um, so any thoughts on this one? This is, this is if a permit were going to be suspended, um, what happens in order to suspend the permit um, and whether there can be appeals and how those appeals work. Um, so are there any thoughts on anything in sections 3A to E that's on the screen right now? Pam. Yeah, I, I would like to hear from somebody, maybe Rob, maybe from any of our, of our audience who might, um, be a property owner, um, if the whole issue was suspensions, because I'm still very strongly wanting to make a statement to potential and existing landowners that that points add up and 
and there are consequences for bad management. So I've heard a couple arguments about, well, we can't do it at this time of year, or we can't do it at that time of year um, because people might be left out in the cold. Obviously, we do not want that happening, but um, there are there are a number of, of communities that have very strict permitting and, and regulations in place, and somehow they seem to manage this. So could I, could I hear from um, somebody just at least explaining, you know, what a duration of notice might be or what a duration of, of suspension might be? Thanks. Rob, do you have any thoughts? Uh, just, just that we, you know, when we discussed this previously under the current bylaw, when drafting the current bylaw, um, you know, with the, the laws of Massachusetts and procedures for eviction and everything that has to happen in order to remove occupants from a, from a building, uh, it was decided that the, any suspension that would be imposed would take effect at the end of a current lease. Uh, I don't know of any reason why that would have changed. Um, we have an interesting case right now that's in front of the court that, you know, um, actually has a, a continued hearing tomorrow. So I'll know more about how the court kind of reacts to some of these uh, situations. But, um, you know, my understanding is that um, in, a, in a, or my, my feeling is in a, in a property that is uh, maybe safe to be occupied and that's not being that's not the issue mm -hmm. uh, removing tenants mid-cycle uh, of a lease uh, for say a zoning violation is is going to be challenging so I think the um, the idea of keeping the suspension something that that uh, takes effect at the end of a lease or uh, when occupancy is ended uh, makes probably is going to make sense um, and then you know from that point, in the discussion, my comment would be that uh, our current bylaw that offers a, a 90 day suspension, uh, I, I think I've said before, just doesn't seem like a useful tool. So we need to do something different that makes it uh, more of a penalty uh, for the landlord so that it's not simply just a vacant unit for the summer months. Oh yeah, right, right. right. Can, can I ask a question? So, so that, We've started here with effective at the end of the lease for six months the first time. And then if within the next five years, they do this again, a full year. Um, my first question is, would that be sufficient um, potentially to, to be that sort of deterrent? And then number two, is the reason we want it at the end of a lease for things that are not um, sort of safety related, I, I forget how you worded it, Rob, um, is because it's considered an eviction if it's not safety related, even if it's being done per the town bylaws? So we have very specific um, situations that we can condemn a building or condemn a, a dwelling unit. That wouldn't, it wouldn't be one of those if we're talking about a zoning violation. So, you know, those, um, you know, those tools that are available in those situations where the building is found to be unsafe uh, just aren't there uh, to be used when we're dealing with other issues. So um, do I, I'm, uh, you know, it'd be interesting, I guess, to play that out um, for real because we haven't done it yet. But um, my, my feeling was that we would probably um, in those situations uh, by order, tell the property owner to empty the building. By whatever means they need to do that, uh, they need to stop renting the unit. Uh, and if that's eviction or if that's relocating or something else, negotiating a deal, that's up to them to figure out. Uh, but, uh, you know, with, with, I think at the time, the landlords that were part of the Safe and Healthy Neighborhood Working Group um, you know, they had strong, strong belief that that was not, uh, that was not going to be uh, a, an effective tool that wasn't going to be supported legally, uh, but we have not tested it. Uh, I do believe we discussed it with our town attorney at the time, and um, it was advised just to stay away from the potential of trying to empty a unit mid-cycle of a lease, 
that wasn't related to one of those, you know, uh, health and safety situations. Uh, but you know, we haven't we haven't tried it yet. Thanks, Jennifer. I guess what I'm thinking of is, so um, obviously, you know, if it's like the issue on Allen Street where it was a it was a major the building had to be condemned so the students have to leave they can't come in that day that's one situation that's not an eviction that's because the landlord I believe had to provide shelter someplace else um, but that was for the tenant safety but if if you have like a scoff law landlord I mean someone who accrues a certain number of points when they go to renew their lease can't there just be they're not allowed to renew it so at that point the tenants have left so I mean isn't that doable without causing tenants to you know anything that could be construed as an eviction they, they just they haven't earned the right to renew their permit yeah absolutely I think that's one scenario I you know what we're discussing a lot with um uh permitting conditions right now really has to do with a situation where maybe the tenant isn't, you know, um, you know, uh, complying with the terms of their lease. And there could be a situation where that results in a violation, maybe that results in a, a zoning violation. And it's expected that the landlord would exercise the terms of their lease, which would probably be eviction, you know, for those, uh, you know, those more um, egregious violations of the, the, the lease. So I think there's a number of different situations, but the one you just described would be probably a nice clean, um, you know, path to a, a suspension. Pam? It occurs to me that that um, the landlord would, would need to know, though, in advance of um, sort of the end of the of the first tenant's term so that they know to advertise or not advertise. And I think that's probably some of the, the tricky timing that we've been talking about. I, I agree with that, Pam, because Rob, do you know when most, we, we've heard from some people that leases for the next year are assigned sometime in January, February, March, yet they don't start till September. Um, <laughs> You know, and we renew July 1. And so if a lease is already signed to start September, how, these are all probably questions we need to ask an attorney, but maybe maybe you you know a little bit about it. But you know, if if we didn't issue that permit, what happens to that lease? Like, is that essentially a a landlord tenant breach a contract type, you know, like what what happens, you know, or are we really getting into problems where you can't even not renew once a lease is signed, you know, type thing? Does that leave the town with some liability? Right. So I, I, that's a good legal question, and we have to we have to see that through and and get get the um, the the best advice we can on that. But when I have looked at that before. Um, my thought would be that our bylaw would specify that the landlord has to do something. The landlord has to have a provision in their lease that would, um, you know, would react to that situation, you know, in the event that their, their um, permit's not renewed for one reason or another, there's some, you know, there's some way for that landlord to deal with that situation with their tenant that isn't necessarily a breach of contract. Uh, so that's a, it's a great question. We need to explore that legally and just see exactly in what form that needs to be, but I think it'd be addressed in the bylaw. And if we don't, unfortunately, then we would be looking at waiting another whole cycle, uh, of a, of a lease uh, and occupancy, which, um, we wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to do. Any further, uh, Shalini? Yeah, could for the people who've been studying it longer was, I mean, do you have other language from other towns, like maybe two or three different ways in which other towns have implemented this? And, and I think it's not going to be a complete surprise for the landlord because it's based on points. So as their points are increasing, they're getting notified at each stage that 
you know, take care of these issues. So hopefully that's not going to be a complete surprise. But I would love to see if possible. This seems like a very important issue, this with inspections and what are, how are other towns phrasing these issues? So I think the language here is basically based on some other towns, but I'm not sure which one because it's been so long since this was drafted. The concern that we've heard in the past from at least one person is if it's not based on a Massachusetts town, um, the landlord tenant laws are extremely different in other states. And so what can happen in say Pennsylvania or Iowa might not be able to happen here because of state law here. Um, but I think we've based this language basically on some other town's language. Not hearing any concerns about this language per se at this point, we're going to move on to appeals. Um, I can't, I can't really read it on the screen anyway, so that's... <laughs> I'm trying, but it's in the packet. It's in the packet. I know. I know. Um, so the appeals section is basically what happens if um, a permit is suspended, revoked, or denied. Um, and so basically there's not necessarily, as written right now, I don't think there's really an appeal um, for anything other than suspension, revocation, or denial. Um, and so any other one, there isn't this appeal process. This only applies if you're not getting a permit or your permit's being revoked, um, at least how it's written. The attorney will tell us whether we that's, that's okay or not. Um, this one maintains a rentals appeal board um, and the rentals appeal board as drafted would include at least one member of the town council, the ZBA, the board of license commissioners and the board of health. Um, it could, a, a, it could be more, it doesn't set a size and it's the manager who establishes it. Um, oh, and it includes the town manager and at least one member of the following. Um, Can we say town manager or designee? I can't imagine that the town manager would have time for this. I mean, not that any other staff person does either, but still. So, so the, the question we have to also ask is, do we want a separate rental appeals board or do we want to assign it to the board of license commissioners? This is one area where the board of license commissioners actually, when I went to their meeting and updated them on this, because I happened to be there for something else, where they they said that they might be willing to take this role on because that, that sort of appeal of a decision, particularly they deal with license decisions, right? And revoking licenses, appealing, things like that, that they felt this type of hearing type process is something that they could handle. Um, and so the question is, do we want to say, go for it? Or do we want to constitute essentially a new body every time there is an appeal? I'd like to hear Rob's thoughts on that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> what, do you, Rob? What, do you, what do you folks do now if there yeah. are, you know, appeals to to your your jurisdiction or your edict. Well, uh, appeals are hand, uh, appeals of our current um, you know work go different places, state boards or local zoning board of appeals. Um, otherwise, if it's um, you know just a concern about um, you know the way uh, a staff person is you know doing their job, it generally goes to the town manager. But um, my, I've always been in favor since we started talking about this uh, of having it go to the board of license commissioners. I think they they would um, it it's they're in a good um, routine with their work that they do. It relates. They have a uh, specialized uh, licensing lawyer that supports them when needed on these matters. We have a, a staff person that's designated to support. The board of license commissioners so preparing all the documents and packets and uh if there are any notices or mailings that are needed uh it would work well you know we wouldn't have to create all that or figure out who would do that you know would it, would somebody from the town manager's office have to do all that paperwork for a hearing like this so i think that's 
you know, for all those reasons, I, I felt like the Board of License Commissioners was was a good place to hold these these appeals. Pam, is the size of the of the Board of Licensure, Licensures um, does does the size matter, or would additional input be appropriate in in sort of this real estate or rental permitting process? So the board is five members right now. Yeah, and I think I think if they, you know, if they were to take on this, I think, you know, moving ahead, the desired qualifications of at least one of the members might might change. Um, we do have a wide range of uh, very experienced and uh, great set of, um, you know, expertise on the uh, on the, the commission right now. Um, legal and otherwise. So I think, um, I think there maybe there'd be a focus in the real estate or, uh, you know, uh, relevant uh, area for this. Jennifer? Yeah, I'm just thinking, um, so the, for a brief time, there was like a pizza bar restaurant where Garcia's was between Bertucci's and Garcia's. And it was, it was a mess. And the Board of License Commissioner did a really good job of suspending the liquor license and closing. They did all these steps and eventually they just, the guy who owned it had to go. So and it they seems were like they have experience. New. And they were pretty much brand new at the time too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So does that mean the four of us are kind of, are, are sort of on to assigning this to the Board of License Commissioners? I'd be supportive of that. And that would mean that um, we can delete this one here. Yeah, yeah, bingo. It's not needed then. <laughs> um, anything, th I th this language, um, I think might have even come from our current bylaw. I'm not sure, because I think our current bylaw has a Reynolds Appeal Board. Um, but we don't have one. <laughs> It's if there hasn't been a suspension, revocation, and all, you never needed to constitute one. Um, so, okay. Anything else with this language or this, the appeals process? I'm just working my way through changing everything that references the Rental Appeals Board. And I wouldn't mind hearing from the audience. On this. We're we're gonna we're gonna have audience comment, um, but I want to get through one more thing before we go to that because they might have comment on that too. Um, which is I want to go back to consent and permit display and use, but start with consent because I'd like to get us. I, I think if we get through consent, we have a draft while not anywhere close to final that can at least be sent off to an attorney to say, hey what might not be complying with law so that we can get our attorney in, I'm hoping for the October 27th meeting um, where we'll actually potentially have an attorney here at the meeting to talk to us. Um, and so we can ask all these legal questions of, of what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, so we can move on some of that. Um, consent, Jennifer. Okay, I have a, we don't have to, it, it's late, um, we're almost adjourning, so maybe it's another discussion, but just a sort of high level altitude discussion of, it, you know, um, I guess this would come under inspections, but they're just seen based on the feedback that we got, the right. forms that were filled out of the engage ambers that came from tenants. There was a lot being reported of just, um, you know, rental dwellings that were just in bad condition. <laughs> I don't know what, I don't even know if they're code violations, but just dirty, um, deferred maintenance. And when I think of, you know, all the properties I see that look pretty crummy on the outside, I guess they're, they can often be pretty crummy on the inside is, would we, if we had annual inspections or whatever, begin to catch this? So just this weekend on the next door app, a mother must have just moved her daughter into a rental unit and she posted 
She said, my daughter moved in. She was assured that this unit was going to be cleaned. And it was just, I guess, dirty and pretty awful. And there was, I mean, there must have been 25 different. There was all this back and forth. People saying, see a tenant lawyer. You know, everybody was weighing in. But I think this is probably not that unusual. So what can we, would these inspection tests just do so that you know, students aren't moving in to these pretty awful places? And I don't even know if that's a violation if a place is dirty, is that a violation? But it just seems like, it, you know, I, I feel like UMass, you know, a lot of students have to live off campus and they're, you know, we discussed this before, they're paying a lot of money for not, certainly not all of it, but it, you know, how do we catch these rental units that are just, um, you know, not a place we'd ever want to live? Rob? Yeah, it, you know, it's possible that it could be a zoning or it could be a violation. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to say with this new regulation that we'll be able to catch all that necessarily. Um, you know, a tenant that moves in can certainly call us and, and we would go look at it and, and get involved at that point. Uh, but we're not going to be able to do pre-occupancy inspections all at that one time. So there, these inspections would occur throughout the year. So we're not going to see it in, in that condition necessarily. Uh, so, you know, I think I do feel like that's going to be useful. That's going to be uh, what starts to change the way uh, landlords manage their properties uh, because we will be conducting inspections and we will be calling out things like that at various points of the year, but it might not be caught at the time of move-in. Uh, like the, the situation you just described. So I responded to this mother and told her to email me. I could refer to you if she does. Absolutely. So consent. I just want to go through some of this quickly. Um, it's got multiple terms right now. I do not know whether anything, any of this violates current state law, but this was some of the stuff that was in a draft, some of the things we've heard, um, which is that applying, so the first one is if you apply for a residential rental permit, you've as owner of the property consented to the inspection that is required to obtain that permit. Um, the lease terms must include um, a provision requiring the tenants to agree to provide reasonable access um, to the property. Um, as required under the bylaw. Again, I don't know whether we can actually do this, but that's something that we've heard. Um, so start with it all and see what our attorney says. Um, the third one is notice to the tenants that the owners must provide seven days notice um, for inspections, um, for the initial inspection, the sort of standard inspection. And if there are follow-up inspections as, as much as possible, as much notice as possible. Tenant authorization. Um, says that the tenants must authorize um, an inspection before the inspection can begin and that consent or they can waive um, um, the, the being there, I guess. Um, they have to be signed um, before you can inspect the dwelling. Additional inspections um, would be, notice of that would be given to the owner at reasonable time and um, known violation with impedes the health, the code inspectors, yeah, our our staff can go to the courts to try and get a um, an order allowing us to go in to inspect. That's the consent side. Uh, Rob mentioned today that he'd like to see another lease term about um, non renewal permit. That maybe we can put that into this section um, where they'd have to have in the term some sort of if the permit is not renewed, um, the lease is canceled. Basically, um, things like that. Um, did I miss anything in consenting and all of the notices and inspection notices for what we want to potentially try to do um, or what Rob needs or all to be able to inspect? Or is some of these too um, onerous to get Rob's team in to inspect too? Um, Pam? It seems like there's a little bit of conflict perhaps with um, you know, the mass renters regulations or requirements, whatever. Um, but I don't think it hurts to, you know, 
enumerate these five or six items. Um, I didn't know if, if in this section we would add something to the effect of all, you know, contact for uh, health and safety agenda that must be posted. And I know, I know the good landlords do that, um, but I didn't know if that's really in essence part of the consent. Like you, you, you the tenant signs on this line saying you're going to let a uh, an inspector in, and you also sign on a line saying you received all of the tenants' rights. Uh, you know. So I don't know if that if that particular element needs to be included here as well. So I think we actually we've got this distribute and I'm browsing it quickly. Um, we uh, a signed copy of the form or proof of delivery maintained by the owner and made available on request. So we've got that some of that is there up in this other section we hadn't gone over with. I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. That, I think that covers it. Thank you. Um, so, and and I, I popped up to this because this is the requirement for displaying the permit and what the permit needs to show and where they need to display it. So um, any other thoughts on these two sections for now? I know we probably have to talk to the attorney a lot. Mandy, do you, do we still have in there the um, the requirement to provide a copy of the lease upon request in another section? I'm just not finding it. A um, lease to the town? To the town, you know, in, in the, um, you know, if, if the situation warrants that we need that information that it's provided to us, and I'm not sure if it belongs in this section somewhere as well or instead, but... Um, I just want to make sure we don't lose that. We use that quite yeah. often. Um, so you, so Rob, you get a copy of the lease when you've said before when it's a special permit, and they provide a copy of the lease as sort of a uh, evidence for you for making the. But but you would like to be able to ask for a copy of the lease for any unit. Well, yeah, there's different. So for special permits, typically there's uh, a template lease that's part of the approval for that, that use. Uh, and that's where we are, you know, through that process, we're inserting the various conditions about gathering size or number of vehicles. Or, and now we're getting even more into the, the details of, um, you know, response to violations. But um, the, by, the current rental bylaw uh, gives us the authorization to to require to request a copy of the lease, and the owner is required to give it to us within forty eight hours. That that's something that we wanted in there from the very beginning, yeah. And and is probably one of the most used provisions of our current bylaw um, because it you know it, it's it's the place we start you know especially when we're dealing with over occupancy because um, at least now in in recent years uh, you know. We get that that lease, and there's of course only for uh, individuals that have signed that lease. Uh, you know that gives us the starting place to to start start a lot of questioning to the the owner about the seven people that we're talking to out in, in the property. You know when there's only a lease of four. So um, and it, I mean there's been other situations where it's been useful for other reasons, but uh, we often ask for it just before we get even going on any uh, investigation. So I don't see it in here now. It might have gotten dropped by accident because I thought I, I was looking for it because I thought we had it as part of the application requirements to provide the lease. Like when you apply for the permit, you must provide the lease. Um, yeah. And so I'll I'll check more fully and make sure we put that in. Would you want a copy of all the leases or do you just want to be able to request when need be? I think probably just when we need it. Okay. Um, just because, you know, managing that kind of additional set of documents might be a lot right now. Okay. Pam, and then we're going to go to public comment. I didn't take my hand down. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, with that, um, we will get to more of this at the next meeting. Um, public comment is now, um, where's my language? Um, 
public comment on matters within the jurisdiction of the Community Resources Committee is open right now. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Um, and we will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment at this time. Um, many who see know that we bring them up within further discussions at later times. So if you'd like to make public comment, please raise your hand. Um, Renata Shepard, please unmute yourself, uh, state your name, where you live, and make your comment. Hi, Renata Shepard um, from Amherst. Uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, comment on uh, timing in terms of either license, issuing permit, whatever is done that is done speedy. You know, that there's no, not a lot of weight that I had sent comments regarding um, like a, getting, making sure to facilitate uh, landlords getting a permit pending even if it's a temporary permit, that they will be uh, fulfilling all the obligations. And uh, and they will because they don't want to lose that rental. And those that don't comply, I mean, that's on them. But um, also regarding uh, showing the lease, um, my lease is like 12 to 14 pages long, depending on the situation. So, and also, I, I would think that's kind of a violation of privacy. I don't know. Maybe that's something to bring up with the attorney. Um, because also there's names of residents. Maybe they don't want to be known to the, you know, public or whatever. So, yeah, a matter of privacy. Um, and I guess that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Renata, for your comments. Um, Seeing no other hands, um, we are going to close general public comment. We have minutes to approve, and then pretty much I'll adjourn after that. We have the adoption of the August 11th, 2022 minutes and the August 25th, 2022 minutes. Are there any requested changes before I make the motion? Shalini. I just had a clarification for um, the 25th one where it said members agreed that permitting per parcel is the preferred permitting yeah. method. And I, I just couldn't remember if we had, it's per, that permit, you know, when we were discussing whether it should be per unit, the fees should be per unit or um, per parcel or per building. And did we say per parcel is the preferred one? Um. We kind of reached an agreement on that um, or or some general right now yeah. to see if that would work when we see a fee structure. Okay. That fees would be per unit of some sort, but per building versus parcel, I believe the conversation was that yeah. it doesn't make much difference from Rob's and the town's point of view. And so it, putting it per building would add a lot of paperwork that doesn't necessarily right. Um, right. add to um flexibility or the ability to charge different fees hmm. especially okay. if the fee structure so i think it was move it back to per parcel and await what we can do with fees got you okay so then we don't need to change that and the other one was where I had made a comment about the parking plan and how that is enforced and i think i just wanted to uh, actually, what I specifically said was the downtown parking, uh, like just using this opportunity to let resident, residents know that the par downtown parking expectations are different as per our zoning bylaw or whatever. And the comment is just saying that it's Bell Mellon asked about the parking plan and how that is enforced. I mean, it's not a big deal, but since it's in the minutes and people might read it, I just wanted to make sure that people do you know what i'm saying that how why like you know how people say like how come downtown they are not being asked for so, so you're looking to add to that sentence which is on page two um the very bottom third to last paragraph Bob Mellon asked about the parking plan and how that it is in how that is enforced and um how residents are notified of different requirements in the downtown area yeah, specifically, yeah, especially the difference between downtown parking and other 
you know what I'm saying? The downtown parking district or whatever it's called. Middle school parking district. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Any other changes? No, that's it, thank you. Okay, well, so um, Pam, I'll send you the modified because I just typed it so I can make the motion. <laughs> um, so we're, I, I'm going to make the motion, which is to adopt the August 11th, 2022 meeting minutes as presented and the um, August 25th, 2022 meeting minutes as amended to add the phrase and how residents are notified of the differences in the municipal municipal parking district at the end of the third to last paragraph on page two. Is there a second? Second. Pam will second that. Um, Shalini, your hand is still raised? Okay. But um, I, do, I do appreciate Shalini bringing that up because I didn't think that we were absolutely settled that that a permit would be by property. I, I just don't think we're on that yet. <laughs> At this point, that's what it says. And then when we get back to those languages, right? Um, <laughs> it may change again. Um, okay, we start with Pam on the minutes. Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Shalini? Yes. And Mandy is an I. Okay, with that, I want to thank you all for your patience. Um, the agenda next week is going to look basically what this week's looked like. Um, we might add a different discussion in. I have to go back to our work plan to see what we might be missing in terms of discussions or first time discussions on the bylaw um, before we go back to language. Um, but uh, that'll be detailed what we're going to focus on in the agenda, but otherwise it'll look like this week's. Any other questions? So do we have um, a meeting for three weeks, right? We yeah. have one on the 22nd, isn't it? See. I mean, that's where we just moved the continued the hearings till. Okay, so we do, because I don't have it in my calendar. I just have the 20. Yeah, we, I did not have also. Yeah, I have on the 29th is the next CRC meeting. Right, me too. I had the wrong meeting date and that's where we just put hearings. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that earlier. <laughs> I didn't did either. I. Um, I believe, can can we go back and modify those two motions? Since we haven't adjourned this meeting yet, Athena? Yeah, unless you want to do me back to back meetings, so I would say do it now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to move to... Um, amend the motion to continue the zoning bylaw article 2 article 3 and article 16th hearing from to amend it from september 22nd to september 29th at 4 30 p.m is there a second second rooney any discussion thank you shalini your hands up hmm. Uh, I just wanted to say that about the entrance thing, I went to the fair today and about 10. Wait, wait, but we're in the middle of a motion on changing hearing dates. So and sorry, then you can talk. so sorry. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> Any discussion on hearing on that that one, that changing that one? Uh, we're at Jennifer. Uh, yes. Uh, Shalini? Yes. Mandy's and I. Pam? Yes. Thank you, Jennifer, for catching that. Um, now I'm going to move to amend the motion um, that to continue the public hearing on zoning bylaw official zoning map to change the date from September 22nd to September 29th at 4.35 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Jennifer seconds that. Um, we're back around to Shalini. Shalini. Yes. Mandy's and I, Pam. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Thank you guys for catching that while well, we could still fix it. Um, Shalini. Intern, and then we're going to adjourn. I'm, so, yeah. I'm sorry, before we move on, I, I, you spoke quickly, and I wanted to make sure that the second one was 4.35 p.m. It is 4.35 okay. p.m. Got it, thank you.
Um, yeah, I just wanted to report back on the interns fair today and they were like 10 to 12 interns from political science and legal studies and all who showed a lot of interest and they might be sending resumes so I'll keep working and I'll report back. And I just also had a question about are, is the up to date data um, in our share full SharePoint? No, here? I will make a note to try and pull. The last time it was pulled was early August. I'll make a note to pull. Mm. Yeah, I can start organizing it. And if there's an intern who works with me, that would be great. But if not, I'll just start. Okay, I will make a note to pull that and get that done tomorrow as long as I still have access. I don't know whether I still have access. Um, so, okay. One very, one yeah. very quick question. Um, I think it was our previous meeting, we asked Rob if we could please get total number of dwelling units in town and total number of owner occupancy, non-owner occupancy as best they could possibly do that. And, and I don't know that we've seen that yet. You have not seen that yet. We are working on it. We're getting really close. It's, um, it's, it's a lot of work, um, and, but we're trying to get you know, as accurate as we can. And just, you know, if you got a minute, um, you know, the, you know, the issues are with, um, you know, different uh, classifications that the assessors use for properties, the way they've taken notes over the years, um, you know, where you might see a uh, owner occupied or non owner occupied note on a card. I, I was shown one today that had both notes on the same card. So, you know, th we're working, we're working on that. Um, our IT department's helping us because we needed to uh, create a new program to uh, be able to compare lists uh, with our prop properties that are permitted and the ones that are, are, we're pulling out of the assessor's data based on something, the, the ownership not matching the property address. We're trying to get them all. And, and we did this back in uh, 2013 is how we started the program. Uh, so we're doing it again. It's much more, um, you know, the systems are help, much more helpful now than they were back then. It was a lot more manual work. Um, and IT is helping us set that up. We're down to about 300 properties that we're still sorting through. Um, but I'm going to be able to give you those numbers hopefully soon, maybe by the next meeting. Excellent. Is there anything, is, just on that note, um, and I hate to, okay, is there anything in our permitting forms that we should also be thinking about as we're, we're collecting data as part of these forms so that these aren't manual things, these are as much as possible sort of data entry rather than just, you know, fill in PDFs kind of a thing. And so that's, it's not a problem in our current system. So the, the, the data we collect in our current system is fabulous. We can sort that and report that. I can give you anything you pretty much ask for about permits we issue or applications that are filed. We're, we're, this has been really slow is that we're going through the assessor's records to try to look for what might be missing. Uh, so I think once we do that and set this up, um, we'll have a good, we'll be in a good starting place. And, and really the key that I see that we weren't able to do last time um, just as a reminder, we just got this permitting system up and running about 15 months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way it was before was, was great that we were able to do it electronically for the applicant, but it wasn't great for us. Uh, but once we have that set up we're, and we're able to maintain it year to year or quarterly throughout the year, um, that's going to make life a lot easier and it's going to be a whole lot more accurate and we don't have to do this again. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Anything else before I adjourn? Your hand's still up, Pam? No. Okay. <laughs> With that, we are adjourned at 6.48 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.